Mr. Chairman, uh, and honorable panelists, Pawan, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very special day today because it is the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. 2nd October, he was born in Porbandar. And it is very fitting that such a conversation is taking place today in the context of the future. Of course, it is also important that I joined the World Bank today. Uh, <laughs> came straight from Ahmedabad, from Gandhi Ashram, to this place on 2nd October. So I do consider this as a fortuitous conjunction of circumstances today, what is going on today. So thank you for coming today. Mahatma Gandhi said, companies should act as enablers for their people to understand that they represent the greater community. Thus profits do not function separately from the greater good of all. There is the philosophy of trusteeship there are some outstanding examples where this has taken root in India and flourished. For example, our one of the greatest industrialist and philanthropist, G.R.D. Tata of the Tata Group was greatly influenced by this philosophy. The principle of trusteeship expresses the inherent responsibility of a business enterprise to its consumers, workers, shareholders, and the community and the mutual responsibility of these to one another. Mahatma Gandhi said of trusteeship, it is true that it is difficult to reach, so is nonviolence. But we made up our minds in 1920 to negotiate that steep ascent. We have found it worth the effort. So that was said 100 years ago, exactly. In the GTI, we have tried to pursue a model and a platform of partnership that creates collaboration and convergence, but also have tried to bring in new partners. And one of the new dynamics that is flowing out of our partnership is the partnership with the industry, both in the public sector and the private sector. The India Wildlife Business Council is an example. Our mission is to create convergence and align the strategies and needs of governments businesses and community to bring conservation into the conversation on economic growth and development. The India Wildlife Business Council will develop projects that demonstrate how conservation can make good business sense with careful planning and the right policies and safeguards. Our Vice President Sanjay Pradhan is the Chief Architect of the new WBI. As we say, and if I may be permitted to say this, we say Tiger is the face of biodiversity, and Sanjay is the new face of the World Bank group. <laughs> God save the World Bank. <laughs> there are very few individuals in the World Bank who have taken on an institutional transformation of this magnitude. Sanjay led the transition of WBI from what was a training center to what is now a center for knowledge and innovation within the bank. As a vice president, he has been a catalyst for doing things differently, collective leadership, and achieving results. I'm most grateful to have had the chance to work with him, and I would like to introduce him now, our vice president, Mr. Sanjay Pradhan. Thank you very much, Keshav, and very warm welcome to all of you. Um, great to have you with us um, on this topic of transforming business for tomorrow's world. I just wanted to say a quick word uh, from the perspective of how the, why this topic is so crucial for the World Bank group. Um, you know, the traditional model of the World Bank was a government-centric one, where there was a sense that governments would solve a lot of the problems. And of course, we now have IFC and MEGA as critical parts of the World Bank group. But in many parts of the World Bank, uh, the, that dominant thinking about government as the source and as the panacea, as the, as the principal agent that can solve a lot of the developmental and global commons problems still is quite pervasive. And really, the frontier of development work is that th all these difficult problems require multi-stakeholder approaches. 
uh, you require different parts of society, business, civil society, government, to play their mutually complementary ro roles. And uh, Keshav said very nice things about the World Bank Institute, but one of the things we have been trying to pioneer in the, or, or really champion in the World Bank Institute is that multi-stakeholder approaches uh, really are needed uh, to solve developmental problems. And uh, therefore, and the role of business uh, in solving or in addressing some of the critical development but global commons challenges is quite crucial. So it's very timely, really, that we have this conversation on how global business is shifting, um, how corporations have to be global citizens, but really how we might pave the way uh, for a world in which the economic value of natural capital is better understood and is seen as a metric for defining and measuring development. Um, these are very important issues that we need to tackle. And we are very lucky to have with us a respected authority with us today on business and environment, someone who has given great thought to the subject of the future of the corporation. Uh, he envisions a dramatic departure uh, from the business as usual, um, indeed. So I'm delighted to see uh, Pavan Sukhdev speaking at the World Bank today. Uh, I believe someone has called him nature's banker. He was once a banker at Deutsche Bank, where he founded and chaired Global Markets Center, Mumbai, a leading edge front office offshore company. He was special advisor and head of UNEP's uh, Green Economy Initiative, the influential lead author of their Green Economy Report, and, uh, and study leader for the G8 plus, four, plus five commission project on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. Pavan also chairs the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Biodiversity and serves on the boards of the Conservation International and the Stockholm Resilience Center. He's also the founder and CEO of, of GIST uh, Advisory, an environmental consulting firm. In 2011, uh, Yale University awarded him the Mikulski Fellowship. He, was, he has also received the Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management Medal for his contribution to economic valuation of the environment. The publication of Pavan's new book, uh, Corporation 2020, comes amidst recognition that modern business and companies working in the develop developing world need an infusion of new DNA for that business. So now let's hear from the author himself. It's a real privilege to welcome Pavan Sukhde. Pavan, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Thank you, Keshav. Uh, thanks to World Bank colleagues for organizing it and to my wonderful panel for being here to uh, bounce thoughts off me. Uh, this project, Corporation 2020, has been a labor of love, and I uh, give a lot of credit to uh, my students at Yale University and to the, uh, uh, to the faculty there for the support that I received during this fellowship. And uh, equally to uh, the Green Economy Initiative Group, who, together with myself, realized somewhere along the path of our efforts that you know we had worked out some fairly robust uh, modeled proofs why the greening of the economy is actually an advantage in, in terms of improved performance, improved long-term employment and employability, uh, um, macroeconomic stability, and so on and so forth, and that there were sectoral cases to be made for greening the economy. But actually, nothing would change because two-thirds of the economy, 60% of GDP, 70% of labor, was basically private sector. In the US, these numbers are 75% and 80%. So here we had it, the wonderful macroeconomic proofs, but no real confidence that unless the microagent itself changes and does not continue to perceive its best performance coming in a brown economy, why should anything change at the macro level? And I think this was the challenge that Corporation 2020 was designed, uh, designed to address. And it is about performance. And I keep harking back to my favorite comment or favorite uh, um, aphorism of all time, which is that you cannot manage what you do not measure. And today's corporation is beset with a performance measurement problem because it is impactful in, in, in many different ways. It is, in my opinion, because of its uh, all-encompassing presence in every aspect of our lives, the most important institution of our times. And yet its performance is only measured 
uniquely in terms of the financial performance for stakeholders who are shareholders, but not anyone else. A corporation impacts society in many, many ways. I think you quoted Mahatma Gandhi and, and, uh, and Tata, and they, I think, had the right vision when they talked about the corporation's purpose being beyond profit. Its purpose was community. Its impact is on social capital, on fabric of, of society. Its impact is on human capital, on creating knowledge and skills for the workforce. Its impact is, is on, on uh, natural capital in terms of how much they use or preempt away from other uses. All of these are impacts of the corporation and therefore part of its performance. However, the only performance that we measure is financial performance for shareholders. And therein lies the challenge. And I think this is the challenge that the TEAB project in part has tried to address. Um, through the TEAB Business Coalition. But, uh, and I'll talk more about that in the Q&A session, but I'd just like to round off by saying that in measuring performance, if you look at the impacts of the corporation beyond uh, the current balance sheet and P&L's capture of uh, financial performance, then you begin to learn many in interesting things. Uh, you begin to understand where your risks are, and that was actually what first drove Jochen Zeitz, the chairman of Puma, to think about uh, valuations. Partly it was his, his uh, reading of the TEAB report, but partly it was his own intuition that as a company which is involved in making branded sportswear, he did not know the water impacts of the leather, the rubber, and the cotton that is used. And yet everyone talked about water scarcity and pollution of water. And that was just not acceptable for a CEO. So it was at, at the essence a risk question that he was trying to address as well as a, a social responsibility question. Today's cooperation, of course, is, is uh, uh, in many ways the big beast. It has, it has, its success predicates upon the MNC model, the ability to be an arbitrager of resources from wherever they are cheapest and sometimes not well governed, the ability to arbitrage and, and uh, obtain labor from wherever we have cheap markets, be it China, India, Vietnam, Cambodia, the ability to capture capacity and government support from wherever it's well supported, be it Korean or Singaporean or Malaysian manufacturing uh, support uh, structures. And finally, it's, it's capacity to grab markets where they are richest, as in Europe, USA, Japan, and so on. So it's a multi-dimensional arbitrager of the entire value chain process. And it is successful at being so because of today's and recent deregulations over the last 50 years in capital markets and in trade, and also because of innovations. The, um, the ubiquitous barcode, which we don't think about these days, it is the barcode that enabled international value chains to be constructed and created and delivered and switched from one to the other at ease, because you knew where your resources were from, where they were assembled, where they were packaged and manufactured into your component parts, and then finally assembled by you and onwards to the customer. Um, simple things like containerization is relatively recent. It's only post-World War, and that has created such amazing capacity. As a result of that, world trade as a fraction of global GDP has grown from 3% in 1970 to 30% today. These are changes within our working lives, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, I think it's worth being aware of this, and equally are changes in the, in the bulking up and the size of the corporation. 1970 had less than 25 corporations of more than $25 billion turnover. Now they are 350. 1970 had less than 20 corporations whose GDP exceeded zero point, oh, sorry, whose turnover exceeded 0.1% of global GDP. Now there are 120, so it's gone up from 20 to 120. And all this while, uh, especially in the more recent years, if you look at the US, the success of the corporation and the MNC is clear. Corporate profits overall sector as a component of, of GDP in the US have increased from, once again, under 3% to something like 15% now. This is between 1980 and, and, so we have, whichever measure you look at, financial performance measure, you see nothing but bulking up and success. And of course, supported by tremendous amounts of lobbying and, and supported by two massive engines. And uh, one engine is advertising. Convinces everyone, including all of us out here, that you know, our insecurities need to be converted to, to uh, wants, which need to be converted to needs, which needs to be converted to demand and production. And that feeds the GDP cycle uh, on which our economy rests. And the other great engine that supports the corporation is us, finance. 
<laughs> because we are the ones who provide the leverage to enable the MNC to grow without bounds. You know, Prometheus Unbound in any country, leveraging as much as it needs to from any source that it needs and from and does so uh, with impunity. And this is these are the, the drivers, if you like, of today's cooperation. But here also are some of the seeds of its potential uh, demise, because we are not seeing the planetary boundaries that are being approached as a result of this model. And we are not being able to, if you like, the internal system of today's micro uh, level, the cooperation, is not being able to respond to what's happening to the outside world. Some of this is, of course, the commons problem. Some of this is, is to do with just sheer corporate greed. I mean, someone once coined this phrase, not greed economy, but green economy. Um, I had used a Gandhi quotation as well in, in memory of the great man once at a panel in Rio, and President Yudhiyono was there, so he heard me comment about Mahatma Gandhi's famous remark, well-known remark, that the earth produces enough for every man's need, but not for every man's greed. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Yudhiyono picked that up and said, yes, what we have today is not your green economy, but a greed economy. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty <laughs> <laughs> so the, these, these, are the, these are the challenges that we face today. But moving out of the, the current constraint box of thinking, how can we move forward? Well, let's analyze. Yes, we have a problem with overall excessive demand, but its micro driver is advertising and the nature of advertising and its intrusiveness. The overall macro problem is underpriced production. And that underpricing has again got micro drivers in terms of n lack of resource taxation in extractive industries, so your resources are too cheap. Um, externalities in the production process, which are just not accounted for anywhere. And, and finally, the MNC model itself, because it is able to arbitrage all of these components of the value chain. And then finally, you have got at the macro level again, um, significant losses in natural capital, indeed many other forms of public good, uh, public assets because we don't price externalities. So again, a micro driver. So we have we have a number of these big macro issues that are driving us into the resource scarcity, uh, excessive demand, underpriced production trap that we are in today. But the drivers finally are micro drivers. And therefore, in my opinion, and that's what this book is about, the best solutions ought to be at the micro level. If we have a problem with corporations not reporting their externalities and therefore never externalizing them, well, the answer is get them to report them. And the good news is, uh, and you'll all be pleased to know, that the T Business Coalition, it's an awkwardly long name, but the T Business Coalition is basically a business externalities coalition. And it's a coalition of coalitions, including the International Integrated Reporting Committee, uh, the GRI, the, the, the World Bank is, is one of the members. The, the, the group is huge, and it's basically got one purpose, which is including WBCSD as a member and, and so on, that the um, quantitative statistics that the corporation uses to discover its externalities, which are provided by WBCSD and, and GRI, should be converted to dollars um, and cents with some standardization of methodology in order that they can finally be reported in, in the corporate accounts. And that reporting will create its own pressures, and I'm sure, John, you talk about that in terms of the transparency and what that means for, for management. Then there are the other factors, which is advertising and leverage. How do we manage that? Well, advertising can be made more ethical. There are examples like the European Cosmetics Coalition, which has already disclosed, uh, sorry, uh, published a set of standards. Leverage can be controlled. In my country, India, there was a time when all of us as bankers used to rail against these so-called uh, consortium limits because they were a way of containing leverage, and of course we never liked that, especially derivative structures like myself, you know, not, in, not exactly enamored of consortium limits. So uh, there are ways around that, but the key thing is the too big to fail corporations. Those are today's risk as I see it. Today we've seen evidence of not just banks being too, too big to fail, and you can justify that on the grounds of systemic stability and, and clearing and settlement, which is essential. But what about insurance companies being too big to fail? AIG, what about car companies being too big to fail, General Motors, uh, airlines, Swiss Air, and indeed, God forbid, even hedge funds are too big to fail like LTCM. So where does this stop, this whole concept of too big to fail? And to me, I see this as a huge forthcoming risk that we are not addressing this, this problem of size where effectively the, the profits that arise from risk taking are internalized and the costs are socialized and therefore fall on us as taxpayers eventually and, and through the exchequer. Um, we need to manage that, and I think there are ways of managing that, which the book talks about, of uh, 
placing capital constraints on the too big to fail. In other words, anything above a certain market capitalization ought also to have capital. It should not just be the banks and intermediaries who are required to keep capital. And the last and sometimes the most interesting debate, because it's much debated, is resource taxation. We tax the goods, which is value addition of the corporation and hard work by employees. We tax salaries and profits. We don't tax the bads. Well, why would we do that if it's the case of an extractive industry? Why not tax resource use and resource extraction? Because that's where the scarcities are, and that's where the public bads are generated from. And I think this is an open debate that's been uh, stoked a few times, including in Australia in 2010. It's been lost a few times, but it still carries on, because I think there is power in the debate, and I think it's up to be taken. So uh, in essence, in some, and in summary, what I'll say is that Yes, we have problems, and yes, they are largely uh, at the micro level, but also, yes, there are solutions, and many of the solutions are examples like Puma and Infosys actually disclosing their externalities, or examples um, such as the, the uh, uh, amazing uh, capital factory that Infosys has created for uh, human capital uh, generation, effectively creating positive human capital externalities. There, there are examples of plenty in, in almost every space, including in examples of capturing um, bads to the commons and taxing them. The sulfur dioxide example was one such. But we can do more, and I think that's the challenge. How do we get beyond where we are today, uh, where there is, I'm very pleased, some consensus and some degree of excitement about this idea of recognizing, measuring, and eventually managing externalities. There's a degree of consensus and excitement there. But how do we get consensus about limiting leverage for the too big to fail companies, or consensus about cutting out uh, some of the, the wrong and uh, uh, unethical advertising practices that sometimes prevail, and rather following the positive models, which we have seen more recently with the European uh, Directive on Foods, or for that matter, the, the European uh, Cosmetics uh, Guidance that has been issued. And, and I think that's where the challenge lies. How do we get the, the good practices and the good models that are emerging to be replicated and scaled? In other words, the challenge today, as I see it, is not one of leadership. I think we have good leadership. The challenge, rather, is followership. Creating that followership, creating the, the frameworks, the rules, the institutions, the prices, I think that's really the challenge. And therefore, uh, going back to uh, Sanjay's point, this is about a multi-stakeholder challenge. This is not just about corporations. It's not just about accountancy bodies. It's not just about tax authorities. It's not just about advertising associations. It's not just about NGOs or the World Bank or the corporate leaders themselves. It's all of the above. It's actually all of the above. And therein lies the, the real challenge. It is a challenge of collaboration. It's a challenge of bringing all of these uh, positive solution forces together towards solving what is clearly the most complex uh, challenge of our time. Thank you. Superb. So that was a very, very thoughtful, uh, very interesting set of interventions, Bhavan. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're now going to begin with the panel discussion. We have a very distinguished group and a, a very uh, diverse group of perspectives that you will hear about. So let me briefly introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, uh, Thomas Lovejoy, to my right, Biodiversity Chair of the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and Environment. Uh, Thomas Lovejoy is an innovative and accomplished conservation biologist who coined the term biological diversity. He currently holds the Biodiversity Chair at the Heinz Center. Um, he served as the president of the Heinz Center from 2002 to 2008. Before assuming his position, uh, he was the World Bank's chief biodiversity advisor and lead specialist for environment uh, for the LAC region, as well as senior advisor to the president uh, of the United Nations Foundation. So please join me in welcoming uh, Tom. Let me go ahead and introduce the other panelists. Uh, to my left, John Adams, senior vice president, investments, uh, senior portfolio manager of UBS. Um, he's been in the investment field for 30 years. The Arbor Group um, uh, at UBS is a portfolio management team at UBS, um, specializing in portfolios that include screening based on environmental, social, and governance criterion. Um, and uh, then we have, to the extreme left, we have Keshav Varma, 
our very own. He is, uh, you've already heard him. He's the program manager for the Global Tiger Initiative at the World Bank. And Keshav is also our resident tiger. So he's, uh, but Keshav uh, uh, has had a very long and illustrious career in the bank and before the bank. Um, I can tell you a lot about uh, Keshav's very illustrious career. He, he was a celebrated municipal commissioner in, in, in India, um, and I'm sure I could, I could spend a lot more time talking about Keshav as about the other panelists. And then we have, uh, to the extreme right, we have Eric Dinerstein from the lead scientist for the World Wildlife um, uh, Fund at the US. He's the vice president for science. Um, Eric is WWF's lead scientist and vice president for science. He's a co-architect and co-author of the Global 200 Ecoregions, an analysis to identify the most biologically important ecoregions on Earth in the terrestrial, freshwater, and marine realms. He's co-author of several books on biodiversity and conservation priorities in various regions. So give, uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to all our four panelists. Let me first uh, turn to Thomas. So, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be with you all today uh, uh, and spend a little time, uh, all of us, uh, enjoying being stimulated by uh, Pavan's latest, uh, because this is just the latest. Uh, so one of the things that I think is, is really very important about uh, Corporation 2020 uh, is that it really looks at the issues uh, systemically uh, across the board, uh, <clears throat> examines the history of the corporation, uh, including the moment at, at which it switched to having a single purpose of generating revenue and usually just at the quarterly basis, uh, as opposed to having other uh, purposes inherent uh, in the charter. Uh, and I think one of the other things that's very, very good about uh, Corporation 2020 is, is uh, Pavan is looking at it within a very short time necessary uh, for change. Uh, and, and certainly, any of us who, who spend every day waking up thinking about the global environment and what we're going to do to, to improve its prospects, uh, uh, find it a very uh, daunting challenge. Uh, and it just gets harder uh, the more we go on without addressing some of the really uh, fundamental aspects of it. Uh, such as those addressed in this book. So uh, I do want Pavan to sort of share with us at some point how he thinks we can actually move this agenda forward. Uh, it's going to require a lot of players to make that happen, I think. Uh, but in the end, uh, unless we, we find a way to uh, adjust the role of the corporation so it is doing uh, more good and less uh, damage to the environment, uh, we're going to be in a pretty pickle. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, so the notion of being able to include natural capital and uh, environmental impacts and in, in how corporations report on what they do, uh, I think is, a, is just a central part of the solution. So I think maybe that's all I'll say right now. Uh, and look forward to hearing from the others. Great, thank you very much. John? Uh, if you'll permit me, I have a few slides, so I'll move over to the podium. Okay. Perfect. Hello and welcome. Uh, so we've, we've heard one banker today give you a, a really unique and important new idea, the idea of corporate capital being directed with full recognition of natural capital. And 
the concept underlying that, which is that all of our economic behavior is dependent upon natural systems and natural capital. So it's simply a matter of recognizing what's there and moving that knowledge into the corporate decision-making framework. Ultimately, what we're going to see is that feedback loops get quicker and quicker and that any type of decision-making process which prevents or is counteractive to state, uh, sustainability on the part of corporations, especially the larger actors, is going to be penalized economically. So in other words, it will be unprofitable to act in a way that is non-sustainable. So we've heard one very unique new idea from a banker today, and what I'm going to do is uh, ask you after I've talked, if, if, if you think that lightning has actually struck twice in one day, because <laughs> I'm going to propose to you an idea that I think uh, you will see as quite new. So a little bit of background on sustainable information. And so what we're talking about today is that feedback loop, what information is out there, and how is it changing to influence corporate decision making. So sustainable capitalism, which it would include sustainable investment as a subset, may be thought of as a market system where the quality of output replaces the quantity of output as the measure of economic well-being. And sustainable capitalism would integrate environmental, social, and governance factors into strategy, the measurement of outputs, and the assessment of risks and opportunities. So what are the inputs that one would measure, the critical inputs or environmental, social, and governance inputs that we call key performance indicators include what you see here energy intensity being the top among the list, uh, glo global greenhouse gas intensity, travel CO2 intensity, waste water intensity, uh, et cetera. You can, you can read through this. I'm just going to go over the outline and breeze through these slides. The thing that is new that I'm showing you is what we are doing at UBS. We're taking publicly available information that is newly available from Bloomberg feeds, and we are actually pricing the impact to earnings, to EBITDA. And what you see there is current and 2013 forecast impact to earnings for Intel for their ESG behavior. So a couple of things to know is that we're very quantitatively oriented. We normalize this information to scale by you know, by, by scaling per million of sales, so that large and small companies are measured equally. And we are comparing to like peers and segmenting production categories so that we really are able to x-ray through and find out what addition or subtraction to real earnings is expected through the ESG conduct of a corporation. The next company that you see is the current and anticipated charge to earnings for poor ESG conduct. In the case of Exxon here, what you see is a long, long pattern of internal energy wastage. They are tremendously inefficient per million of sales compared to their peers like Royal Dutch Shell, British Petroleum, Chevron. And we know when we're looking at this information that it's, there's a really significant cost to earnings. Now, this information that you're looking at, this is information that all portfolio managers have on hand. These are algor algorithms built through Bloomberg that were not available three years ago. ESG, or what is in the United States called socially responsible investment, basically examined a whole lot of subjective information. And there, there was a lot of very dated EPA information on the environmental side, a lot of very subjective evaluations um, having to do with looking at, well, let's say, governance inputs such as uh, CEO and board compensation for companies in different sectors. The thing that I can tell you without getting into the weeds is that there wasn't enough hard data. Now, the 3,000 largest publicly traded corporations in the world are 
required to provide inputs and about 110 ESG measurement items to Bloomberg. There are other information sources, but what I can tell you now is that we are able to drill down and look at important quantitative information and in real time make decisions about which companies we are going to invest in for secondary offerings, debt offerings, and uh, this, this is a really important change in the, the, what is publicly available and that feedback loop pricing uh, company behavior in all of these areas. So I'll give you a little bit more information about who is providing this information. Uh, Bloomberg is our primary source. However, Sustainalytics and True Cost are, are really significant in the European theater. Uh, CSR Hub, the Carbon Disclosure Project in the Greenhouse Gas and, and Energy Footprint Area, GRI, you've heard about today, and the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment. Um, I'm, I'll go into a little bit right here just to show you what the key environmental measures are that we're examining. These are the key social uh, areas and then governance inputs. I want to just say one thing about governance inputs so that you get an idea of what we think will happen on the environmental side. Governance, uh, the, the, the really heavy weight measure isn't whether boards are staggered or whether there's say on pay or cumulative vote voting. It really has to do with whether we think executives have their hands in the till, whether they're overcompensated. And we saw this uh, in the US banking system. So we invest globally and we invest in banks. And we had tapered down because of governance issues on investment in almost all U.S. banking organizations. We held one U.S. bank at the time of the crash, although we held over a dozen banks on portfolio, major money center banks. Well, governance hadn't mattered at all to shareholder performance for a decade uh, until it mattered. And what, there, what we saw in 07 and 08 was a phenomenal correlation between the companies that failed governance screens and those that simply went bankrupt. We think that there is a similar thing that's going to happen in the environmental area. It may not be as stark, but we all already see a rush on the part of large resource extraction companies to engage in biodiversity offset transactions. And I'm sure some of you are very expert in, in this area at the bank. But what, what we are seeing is that some of the very largest infrastructure and mining projects are being financed by banks that are requiring a zero net loss biodiversity impact. And that, that has tremendous implications for corporate conduct in that area. Okay, so brief wrap up. Here are the conclusions that I wanted to get through. It's now possible to determine the addition or cost to corporate earnings for ESG conduct from publicly available information. I don't think anybody's presented that at a conference before. This is really, really new, and it's, it has huge implications in, in our field of investment management. Corporate disclosures of ESG information is a powerful driver for change in favor of sustainable, efficient, and responsible corporate conduct. Improved corporate disclosure is good for companies as well as for investors. Companies look closely at data that they publicly disclose. They look more closely at data that they publicly disclose than is simply internally generated and reviewed. So ESG integrated financial analysis is it's new, it's very complex, it requires sophisticated inter interpretation by both investors like ourselves and corporate leadership. So the largest investment fund in the world, Norway's sovereign fund, is producing among the best returns in uh, of all large funds, they use an integrated ESG investment model. Uh, nearly one out of eight dollars under management in the United States today is involved in a strategy of responsible or sustainable investment. So what you see is that quite a bit of capital is already looking at this data right now, and corporate leaders know that. 
Um, you can download a PDF of this, but this gives you the background back to the Quakers uh, who did weapons exclusion in portfolios in around 1900 through, uh, you know, the uh, peace movement, environmental movement, and, and what we see right now is the mainstreaming as all of this, this information is readily available to large investors. There are four academic studies that I quote at the back of this, and this shows essentially that there is an addition both on the debt and equity side to value for investing in companies with long-term strong ESG metrics. And I'll let, let you read through that. We don't have time today. So the thing that I, I do want to do is make sure I read through these quotes quickly to wrap up. This is the last page. Business corporations and markets need to alter their focus from maximizing short-term profit to maximizing long-term value. And long-term value expressly includes the societal benefits associated with or derived from economic activity. The connections between economic output and ecological and society health are no longer obscured. They're expressly linked. All the information is now very quickly and publicly available. So the transformative power of corporate leaders acting in well-informed, long-term self-interest shouldn't be underestimated. In fact, it is the engine of transformation that is most likely to succeed. And because of that, this is why I applaud Pavan and his group for bringing the spotlight, because I think that this transformative power is going to be accelerated tremendously by the newly available information flow. And we, we may look at something that reaches tipping points very quickly because of that. Thank you. Very good, John. That was very innovative, and lightning has indeed struck twice. So this was really good. Uh, Keisha, over to you. I moved into biodiversity after pursuing industry and urbanization and infrastructure for a long time. And, but I'd like to share some of my observations and experiences as uh, we evolved the Global Tiger Initiative. One, uh, and I'd really like Pawan to give some guidance on it. One of the issues which really strikes me is the lack of resources in the sector, in the biodiversity sector, and the sheer potential that exists. But there is a lack of business models here. The other is the challenge that the economic resource corridors and the natural resource corridors are overlapping each other. One of the 